Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on returning guest, Mike Rinder. Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeff. It's good to be back. Mike, one thing I want to talk about today is 2014, yep. looking back at Church of Scientology. Now, the Church of Scientology began 2014 with this Super Bowl ad. That had to cost upwards of a million dollars. And what the ad featured was the new e-meter and flag and, you know, the superpower building and so on. That was the PR face they wanted to present to the world, but what really happened was fighting on Craigslist to play small ads that didn't even mention the Church of Scientology. Small, misleading ads. Mike, could you briefly discuss the reality versus perception? Yeah, sure, Jeff. I mean, there's two parts to this. There is the reality within the church and the perception within the church, and then there is the reality and perception that the church is trying to portray to the world. Internally, that ad had only one purpose. It was so that David Miscavige could stand at the New Year's event and announce that the church was putting out these new uh, exciting new ads that were going to let the world know about Scientology and the biggest splash that could be made with those sort of ads is to tell everybody that they're going to be appearing on the Super Bowl. And that was exclusively and only for the people who paid the money on the promise that this massive international campaign would be launching of new Scientology ads. It is great proof for people like that if they watch the Super Bowl to see the ad because, oh yeah, there it is. But anybody that's ever been in in advertising or marketing knows that the value of uh, an ad on the Super Bowl is very, very, very minimal when compared to or unless one follows it up with saturation advertising of the same thing. Unless you're a household name and you just want to have uh, Coca-Cola known or Budweiser known because it advertises. But if you don't do uh, saturation advertising of those sort of ads subsequent to that, it's a worthless exercise, worthless at least with respect if the purpose was to actually contact people and get them interested in Scientology. But there is another part to that. If the purpose of those ads was to actually interest people in Scientology, they were about as as far away as the man in the moon shouting and saying, come on in to Scientology. Because showing an e-meter is, uh, and talking about the, the 21st century e-meter, is one of the corniest things that you could possibly do if you were trying to interest people in Scientology. So those ads were necess or that ad was necessitated by the fact that they had spent a lot of time and effort collecting money from people on the basis that there was going to be these new ads. Those ads are for the Scientology public. They're not really for the the non-Scientology public. And they're shown once or twice at big uh, splashy uh, events so that it can be said, see, we did it, and then they can carry on raising more money. I mean, they raise much more money for those ads than they ever spent on them. You can guarantee yourself that. And then they went on to the next thing and started raising money now. Oh, well, now they're raising money for the new studio that's required to produce ad uh, in theory, I guess, because the studio they have or the massive uh, studio facilities they have already aren't good enough to do them. I, I, I can't quite think with this, this plan they have with KCET Studios in LA when they've got huge studios out at Gilman Hot Springs, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of state-of-the-art studio equipment and studios, and they're not using those, and they've got Mad Hatter Studio in LA, which millions of dollars was spent on, and they're able to produce audio and visual properties that are 
just as good as you can do anywhere in the world. They're only limited by the imagination and skill of their operators, not by the lack of plant. But meanwhile, now they're out announcing at New Year's event yesterday the great big accomplishment that they're going to be opening this brand new studio to produce all of these ads and reach the world with these these sort of ads. But just a minute, you need to give us money before we can do it. So it's become a new money-making scam to collect funds from people to now buy another studio <laughs> because if they can't, they can't just keep saying we're going to produce more ads because it's it's like illogical. We already produced them. They were already the greatest thing since since sliced bread, according to Miscavige, when he announced the ad. It ran on the Super Bowl. Technically, it was, uh, you know, very high quality. There was nothing wrong with it quality-wise. And yet now they're off raising money so that they can buy more studios. But those ads didn't even run anywhere other than the Super Bowl and an NBA playoff game and, you know, some sort of music award show. And that was it. And then they were never heard from again. Mike, you raised several interesting <laughs> points I wanted to cover. The Super Bowl ad is preaching to the choir. It's internal consumption only. Right. Now, in terms of the Scientology's uh, studios, they do have Golden Era Studios, a multi-million dollar studio. They do have the Mad Hatter Studio, which they purchased from Chick Corea. And now they have KCET. So in corporate terms, they have massive over capacity to produce content and they're not using it. In fact, they went to Craigslist. Like this was so stunning to me, Craigslist. And they advertised much as the way Amway did, which is to say misleading. They wouldn't tell you it was Scientology. There were tiny little Craigslist ads. Are you interested in self-improvement? Do you need marriage help? They're pushing buttons, right? Career help, money, job. And this is why, and it's so fascinating to watch, the Red X Brigade, part of Anonymous, are out nuking the Craigslist ads, flagging them for inappropriate use. It's interesting to see this this multi-billion dollar international church tied down to Craigslist misleading ads. <laughs> Even the Jehovah's Witnesses are not afraid to go to your door and say, hello, we're from the Jehovah's Witnesses. Here's our booklet. Yeah. Why, why does the church have to hide who it is on Craigslist of all places? Well, think about it, Jeff. First of all, the reason they're on Craigslist is because it's free. So they don't have to get any money to do that. So they can just go out and, and do these things. And one guy in one place at one time found that that got some response from someone. And then that spreads like wildfire throughout the Scientology world. And everybody's out, then goes out and does it. But then what they discover is, oops, if we say that we're Scientology when we do any of these things, people because they're seeing it on the internet in front of their computer, quickly Google Scientology, and they don't want to have anything to do with it. So they've got to avoid saying in an item where they are seeking to reach a public sitting on a computer, they cannot use the word Scientology because it's too easy to open another window and Google Scientology. This is a church that claims to be about communication, truth, spiritual enlightenment, and yet they have to lie about who they are on Craigslist. <laughs> Looking forward into 2015, what do you see for the church? Is it more of the same? Is it experimenting? What, what, what do you do when you have nowhere to go? <laughs> well, you asked me, what do you see for the church? And all I could think of was Muhammad Ali's comment, what do you predict for the fight? Pain. <laughs> I, see, I see a lot of pain on the horizon, Jeff. I see things increasingly more difficult to manage and control from the perspective of Miscavige and how is he going to deal with the problems that he confronts because the fingers in the dike that he has been frantically placing there are now being overwhelmed by the flood of water coming through. And it's coming through from all different avenues. It's the internet. The internet is such a huge problem for Scientology because it has exposed so much to public view that used to be able to be kept secret. The media 
which no longer is cowed by the church into not doing or saying anything. And while there aren't that many programs that, or articles that have been out there, there is now a body of work that has been generated primarily being led by Joe Childs and Tom Tobin at the Tampa Bay Times, but also in a lot of other uh, media. And that is about to become uh, an avalanche. Uh, the HBO and Louis Theroux's documentaries are going to open the floodgates, I am sure, to many, many more people reporting on what's going on in the Church of Scientology. And then there is just the, the fact, well, there's ongoing legal cases, and a lot of those are very problematic. Uh, the knocking on cases uh, seem to be a, a real albatross that they can't get out from under. The Garcia case is now heading toward a bit of a showdown where I believe that it's the outcome is not looking too positive for the church. The uh, Monique Rathman case is still pending, uh, waiting for appeals. So to the Dykeman case in California, those cases are all each. Each one is significant in establishing new rules. And I don't mean new law, I mean new rules about whether the Church of Scientology or Scientology-related entities can or cannot be held accountable in court, because it's been pretty much a free ride for some time, and the writing is on the wall that the free ride is about over, and that uh, courts aren't going to just sit back and watch clear abuses and violations of human rights be carried out under the guise and the false shield of we're protected by the First Amendment. And on top of that, there is just the straight up and down hard, cold facts that Scientology is failing. The Church of Scientology is failing. Its organizations are empty. Its missions are closing. The number of people who are in the new SP building in Clearwater, the monster that was open to great fanfare last year, wouldn't even fill one floor of that building. If you put everybody together, they might possibly occupy one floor. And there is another seven that are empty. The reality is becoming harder and harder to sweep under the rug. The Wizard of Oz behind his green curtain is very close to being exposed for what he really is. And I see 2015 as probably being the year when Great Wizard of Oz is exposed as the little man pulling levers. Mike, that is a very compelling statement, and I'll add to it. Alan Cartwright, the Church of Scientology International uh, legal officer, was deposed, and Ray Jeffrey asked him if Captain David Miscavige had a cell phone. Alan had to say he used to, but I don't think he does any longer. <laughs> this is all. This is on my Scientology Money Project, and I'll I'll post it as a companion. Alan Carwright also said that David Miscavige does not use a telephone because founder L. Ron Hubbard said telephones are psychotic. Hubbard said this because telephones don't have a memory. That bit of thinking aside, Alan Carwright was saying in deposition that David Miscavige does not want to use the telephone, does not have a cell phone. Talk about the Wizard of Oz not wanting to receive communication. I was frankly shocked by his legal officer saying he doesn't have a telephone because what kind of executive doesn't want to be in communication or have a telephone? Well, you look the, at the, the, the truth of the matter is, Jeff, he's got a bunch of phones. He doesn't, he doesn't not have a telephone. That's just a, I mean, if anything, it is a, a an artful lie in that, well, Larise Stuckenbrock really has his phones and she carries them with him, her 24 seven and she is alongside him 24 seven. And so if the phone rings for Dave, Lou answers and hands the phone to Dave. So it's not really Dave's phone. He doesn't really have a phone. Lou has it. And probably if 
he had been asked that question, he probably would have, you know, figured out, well, I don't really know. I'm not really aware of that. Uh, I, I'm no expert on this or whatever, because the truth of the matter is he didn't want to say that David Miscavige knew about anything. He had his instructions. Make sure that you do not admit that COB knows anything because you're too stupid to figure out what's important and unimportant. So just say he doesn't know anything about anything. Now, turning to, to COB not knowing anything, and for our listeners, COB is Chairman of the Board Religious Technology Center, David Miscavige. He goes by the title COB. In the Sea Org, he has the rank of captain. He is Captain David Miscavige. Again, in the public deposition, Ray Jeffrey spends probably an hour arguing with David Miscavige's attorney, Lamont Jefferson, Lamont Jefferson says, please, you don't call my client Captain Miscavige. Don't call him Captain Miscavige. And uh, Ray Jeffrey would say, but he is Captain Miscavige of the Sea Org. This again is more artful evasion. Why doesn't David Miscavige want to be called Captain David Miscavige? Because he believes that that will then be used to prove that as the captain, he is like the captain of the ship and he really is in control of everything, which is true. But he's, a, he's deathly afraid that the moniker captain, which he loves people to refer to him as in the church, would be prejudicial to his argument that he doesn't have anything to do with anything when he gets into court. And Mike, help me take apart some of the uh, Byzantine organization of the church. Marty Rathbun has said that the highest ranking member of the C organization runs the Church of Scientology in totality. True or false? Absolutely true. Therefore, David Miscavige is the highest ranking member of the C organization. Correct. Now, and But on the other hand, you could also say the person who runs the Church of Scientology is the highest ranking person in the C organization. It's all one and the same, Jeff. There's no, there's no distinction to be made between the seniority of authority in Scientology and the seniority of authority in the C organization. The C organization is a, a veil that sits over the top and is a way of describing and controlling things, but they go completely and utterly hand in glove. So Yes, David Miscavige is the head of the C organization. He's also the head of the Scientology hierarchy. Now look at these purposeful evasions, these attempts, attempts to evade. David Miscavige doesn't have a phone. His rank of captain means nothing. And this is why the church has to go on Craigslist as well. Of course it, it is. You're exactly it, right, Jeff. I mean, when you start, when you start trying to create a false truth about that sort of thing, you've got to start. It just, it's like the, the dwindling, the dwindling spiral, the, the slippery slope. You start lying about one thing, you got to start lying about the next one. And then in order to keep your lies sort of together and consistent, you end up not really being able to say anything much at all. No, you can't. And, and this is why the Church of Scientology does not have a spokesman, per se. I think they have people that issue press releases. But again, I, I look at someone like Sir Richard Branson of the Virgin Companies. Mm -hmm. Very much a leader out there communicating every day through social media. And I really enjoy uh, Sir Richard Branson's work. He's someone I see as a, as a good, strong leader with a, a strong PR profile who's not afraid to engage the public. Even when they had an unfortunate, tragic accident of the, of the rocket blowing up, yep. he was there on the scene immediately. You contrast that with Miscavige's leadership style, there is, there is no contrast. I think this was very vividly brought to the fore, Mike Grinder. Let's discuss LAX and what happened when three senior Church of Scientology officials accosted Marty Rathbun. What is your take on that incident? Idiocy, Jeff. Pure idiocy. Uh, my take on that is, and this is a, this is reading tea leaves a bit, but it's probably sure. uh, pretty accurate. The the idea that anybody would do such a thing and so foolishly when uh, there was a pending lawsuit uh, uh, and this topic of those sort of actions is right at the forefront of that lawsuit. 
and the idea that it would be done when there are already videos out there of people coming and quote unquote confronting Marty Rathbun and the idea that it would happen in any form whatsoever anywhere, let alone with those three people, is very, very difficult to comprehend. And the only thing that could possibly explain that is that David Miscavige has told Jenny Linson and Mark Yeager and Dave Bloomberg that they have failed miserably and everybody has failed miserably in their earlier efforts to get Marty Rathbun so riled up that he lashes out in response. And that if it had been him that was doing it, he would have gotten that done by now, but they're too incompetent and they have failed. And not only that, they have failed because instead of making it clear that this was an action of the Church of Scientology, they should have been saying that this was uh, their personal message to him. Because Miscavige thinks that if they say it's his, their personal message to him, that that kind of makes it, that it can't be, the church can't be held accountable for it. That That's the sort of nutball think that goes on inside his bubble head, inside his bubble. He believes that if he tells these fools that they should go out and do this, and that if they stress long enough and hard enough that this is their personal message to Marty Rathbun, that it will not blow back on the church. And that if they do a good enough job of getting in his face and impinging, that he knows that Marty Rathbun is a lunatic, so therefore Marty Rathbun will lash out and he will do something and they will be able to then hold that against Marty Rathbun for as long as Marty Rathbun walks this earth. And they went back and reported back to Miscavige and told him exactly what they had done and he was high-fiving them until suddenly the thing went viral. Mike, what happens in the church when it goes viral? Then those three guys are now held up as an example of fuck-ups again. See, they fucked it up. They were high-fived when it first happened, then when it starts going wrong, now suddenly they're fuck-ups. They did it all wrong. They didn't handle it right. They should have been more in his face. They were too backed off. Anything you can think of, now they're going to be told that that's why that it's not that this was a crazy idea in the first place, it's that they didn't carry out the orders correctly. They didn't do exactly what Miscavige told them should, should be done, so therefore it failed. And that will tell you then that probably this is going to happen again. Okay, and what happens? They go do it again. They just pick other guys this time because those people were incompetent, so now... Randy Stith and Chris Smith are sent to do it. I mean, it's like, huh? And when they didn't get the job, the next people that are going to show up is who knows who? I don't know, hired actors? And they're going to come and, and like, quote, get in his face? And it will carry on to prove that Miscavige is right when he said, if you guys will just do what I tell you, Marty Rathman is going to crack and go nuts on, and you'll get it on camera. And yet that doesn't happen. And switching <laughs> gears so much, one of the church's biggest problems, 2014, was South Africa. Miscavige sends in a Sea Org mission to do what? Handle the scene and get things in order? Yep. Deal, deal with the uh, recalcitrant Africans. <laughs> From your experience in the church, what is the report card? What's the grade on how the Sea Org handled the South African scene? A uh, flunk. <laughs> F minus. <laughs> A big flunk. But those people that were sent there to do that, Jeff, were sent there on the basis of the orders that they had. They, it's not that they misimplemented what they were told to do. They went and did exactly what they were told to do. And I, I can just see it now. The orders were, you better go and let them know who's boss you better put some heads on a pike. You better get this scene back under control. You better, you know, I don't care who it is. I don't care what they are. If there is someone that, that's got, 
you know, CI to command intention, declare them, get rid of them, throw them out, let them all know, scare the rest of them. And they did that. They, they did a great job of that. They didn't really scare the people, <laughs> a lot of people, but <laughs> they did get rid of a lot of people and they got rid of the people that were getting anything done and the source of a lot of their income. And they proved to a lot of people that who knew the people that were thrown out and declared, they proved that they're just crazy that, you know, this person, I know this person and they're not an SP. Miscavige thinks that he can send his little stormtroopers anywhere and go smash people, and that is going to be an effective way of dealing with whatever it is that he feels like needs to be dealt with. And the truth of the matter is, you can't go to an area like that, particularly one that, that, that's that remote, and start smashing the opinion leaders. Because they're opinion leaders for a reason. Everybody listens to them. That's why they are an opinion leader. And if you go and start smashing the opinion leaders, all that happens is those people that look to them for their opinions and guidance and leadership all think that the people that declared them are nuts. And that's what's happened. Well, certainly. And, and especially in a place like South Africa where, where so many families you know, it, the church is made out of families and extended families. So if you declare one member in a family, you know, the whole family knows about it. The clan knows about it. Yep. And the other families know about it. Mike, what do you think in 2014 were the Church of Scientology's three central problems, three biggest problems? Was it South Africa? Was that one of them? Or were there bigger problems? I would put number one on the list of their biggest problems in 2014 being the whole situation with Narconon. I, I think that that is a monstrous problem for Scientology. Could you elaborate? Well, there's, you know, 26 uh, lawsuits now being filed over, you know, wrongful deaths and misappropriation of the titles that they didn't really have that they were using to generate or create the impression that they were legitimate. Very, the sheer volume of them, each telling a similar story about how they were tricked into participating in Nakanon without being told of its connection to Scientology, while being told of its uh, incredible efficacy, which is not actually supported by fact, and that the people that participated would be medically supervised when they really weren't, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is a problem, and that is a huge problem. Yeah, and to go back to the Craigslist problem of, of you know not wanting to say who you are, that is one of Narconon's central problems: is not being willing to say that it's connected to the Church of Scientology. Of course. And so again, we see the church hiding. Next to Narconon, what's the second biggest problem they had in 2014, in your opinion? The exposure of the realities of disconnection. And that came about really through the Leah Remini stories and fiasco that happened. A lot of other exposure of that subject because ultimately that is an Achilles heel that is a uh, going to bring the whole thing crashing down in my view because it's it's you know I've analogized it to segregation and that this is a barbaric practice that back in the early 60s people did it on the basis that it was legal and that it was it was a, an accepted thing within the law and today Scientology thinks that they are able to get away with doing these things that break up families and create horrendous pain and suffering to people on the basis that they're protected by the law. And ultimately that, that is going to change because public outcry is going to reach the level where they, they can no longer justify or get away with it. Things will change that will force that to change, and I think that there was a big crack that opened very wide over the last year on that subject. And hand in hand with that, Jeff, is the fact that the media is no longer cowed by the threats of the church. 
the very fact that they made such overt, blatant th threats that they were going to sue the New Yorker and that they were going to sue Vanity F and did not do one of the things that they promised that they were going to do has left them without credibility as a threat in the media. And then I think that the third thing that is really, really problematic and is very underplayed here but will blow up and cause a lot of other problems in the future is the legal situation in France. What's going on in France? Well, the church was convicted of fraud there. And that was appealed and appealed and appealed. And ultimately, they have lost every appeal. And the next step that's going to happen is there is going to be an effort by the French government to close down the Church of Scientology in France. And I don't think that they are going to win. And the church can can say, oh, we're being persecuted, we're, you know, this is terrible, we're just being singled out, et cetera, et cetera, and, the, you know, they don't have true freedom of religion in France, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of which may or may not be true. I, it, but the, tr the fact of the matter is France is a very, very influential member of the European Union, and believe me, when a government is taking a stance like that it will affect other governments it will i don't care how much you say oh well it's just france or we're just being persecuted believe me there are a lot of other government agencies across europe who are going to take note and are going to and i believe are going to probably do or initiate actions of their own and I think that Scientology is probably looking at a very, very rough period in Europe. Scientology is a very United States-oriented organization and, and pretty insular in that regard. If you're going to look at where are the organizations of Scientology, they're in the United States and they're in Europe. And then there is another 10% scattered around the world outside of those two locales. So it is hugely important and they don't have a grip on that. South Africa is one thing. It's in the overall scheme of things relatively small. It's an interesting microcosm of how dissatisfied generally people are in the church with what's going on in the church. But it's not going to have a, a big impact on the overall picture of where is the Church of Scientology at, where is it going in 2015 and beyond, if it lasts beyond 2015. Well, that's certainly ominous, uh, your statement, if it, if it goes beyond 2015. There's always a question is going on, when does it end, how does it end? But endgame notwithstanding, Europe is a big problem for the Church of Scientology and has been historically. There's an excellent writer named Johnny Jacobson who whose blog, Infinite Complacency, mm -hmm. it's, it's infinitecomplacencyblogspot.com. Johnny is covering events in Europe. His blog is interesting because the Europeans have a very different view of religion than do Americans. And I don't think Americans really appreciate how different the European view of religion is. If the church is outlawed in France, that's a shockwave. That's a seismic level shockwave in the church. Internally, what can the church do? I mean, they have to accept defeat in France. You can't cover up that kind of thing. No, you. I mean, you can you can jump up and down and yell and scream religious persecution, and you know you can't do this because we're recognized in the United States and blah 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 blah. The weight that that carries is not as great as the weight that the the government and courts of the nation of France carry. It's just like trying to fight a battleship with a pea shooter. You can spit your peas as long and loud as you want and complain that it's not fair and this and that, but that battleship is going to roll into town and you're just going to be left as a churned up uh, flinders in its wake. And that is going to have an impact on what happens with how Germany 
proceeds, how, well, we already see it with Holland. Holland is already taking a lead from France and Belgium. And that's no big surprise. I mean, Belgium, because Belgium is the next one that's going after France because they've had this criminal case going on for like 20 years or more. And they're about to actually have that case tried. And Belgium, of course, is very, very closely tied to France because the southern part of Belgium speaks French. It's, a, it's basically like France. But the northern part of Belgium is Flemish. And that's, a, that's Holland. So there's a lot of influence from Belgium into Holland. So you see the creep starting with it's going from France and then it's in Belgium and now it's going to Holland. And then the next thing you'll see is it'll go into the Scandinavian areas and then maybe into Germany and Spain. I don't see how, un unless there is some unbelievably, unthinkably, radical changes in the church and how it operates that it has long to survive in Europe. I can certainly understand what you're saying. Europe is, uh, I think, a make or break point for the church. Mike, going back to Narconon, if you look at the church's pool of income, their obvious big money maker is flag land base. Now, as I calculated from 990 returns, Narconon probably brings in $100 million a year. It's much bigger financially than I think is generally realized. And that's adding up all the Narcanon 990 statements. Mm -hmm. If Narcanon went out of business, that is, if it had to quit operating, that would be a big blow to the church's gross income. Therefore, I can see why the Narcanon lawsuits are a big threat, not to just Scientology, but to its income. And that's really what it watches. Do you think the church would take Narcanon I mean, put it out of business, cut its licenses in order to survive. Do you see that happening? Oh yeah, sure. I think that that's a I think that's a likely scenario. I mean, I've said before, when you know they they came out and said, "Well, we're buying this Larry Hagman's estate in Ohio, and you know the former president's getaway somewhere in Virginia and something in South Africa and all these things to to create these." celebrity narconons that I thought that might, what might happen is if, if the heat gets too much for narconon, that the church will simply cut all ties to narconon and just start something else. Another drug rehabilitation program with a different name and with different licenses using exactly the same stuff, but just do it differently and cut the cord and let Narconon drown in its own misery. And I think that that's still a relatively likely scenario, although I will say that the bad PR that would be associated with that is such a huge, huge pill to swallow that I wonder whether it really would ever happen because it would just be uh, a black eye that I don't think that Miscavige could effectively cover up. It's it's difficult to explain it. You have to, would have to sort of say, well, you know, they were. It was badly. So, you know, people got in control of it that were that were doing the wrong thing, and we didn't know anything about it, and they they torpedoed it, and so we've started something new and just kind of pretend that. It just was somebody else's fault and it all went away. The one thing that the Church of Scientology has going for it as a cult is it basically can tell its parishioners whatever it wants or it doesn't have to tell them anything at all. This is the essence of being uh, in the Church of Scientology. You, you nod when you're told something and you know you want to survive it, right? Yep. Because you want to go up your bridge or your kids are in and you can't quit. Yep. Mike, I have a friend who's an OT8. He's been in the church since 1964. He told me once privately he will die in the church. He said, Jeff, I will die in the church. I don't have any way out. And I understood what he meant. He couldn't. It would cost him everything if he left. It would cost him his children and his grandchildren. It would cost him his business. Yeah. He can't leave. What do you say to someone like that who's, who feels that they can't leave and yet they want to leave? Um, what do you say to someone like that? Um, grow a pair. 
I, I don't know, Jeff. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I think that it, it very much depends on who the person is and ultimately that they should know that there is, in fact, a life outside of the Church of Scientology, even if you want to be a Scientologist. And hmm. I think that that's probably the thing that the church tries desperately to prevent people from knowing by portraying everybody who's outside the Church of Scientology as, quote unquote, a squirrel. I mean, I mean that's the mantra that is used that everybody is a squirrel. So there is only one place that you can get Scientology, and that's inside the Church of Scientology. And that is about as opposite as you can get because there isn't a whole lot of Scientology that happens inside the Church of Scientology anymore. You're much, if you want to be a dedicated practicing Scientologist, you are much better off doing that outside the church than inside. You will get a lot further for a lot less money with a lot less pain and suffering and with the same or better materials than you get inside the church and with certainly with better auditors than are inside the church. So why, you know, what do you got to lose? Well, exactly. And to your point, if you have to leave and it costs you something, so what? Really, at some point, you do have to have the courage of your own convictions. I've told people that, in, in my opinion, the EP or the end phenomena of the Church of Scientology is that you leave as a function of your own self-determinism, <laughs> that, you, that you cannot be spiritually enlightened and remain in that group. And, and I understand that the, the existential struggle ha people have of being in a church Having grown up in the Pentecostal church, I know the pull that a church can exert on you, but I also know what it is like to break free. Mike, always appreciate the work you do on your blog every day and forward to uh, having you on the show again in 2015. Thank you for all you do. For our listeners, we're available at survivingscientologyradio.com. We're available on YouTube by putting in Surviving Scientology. We're also available on iTunes. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is Jeffrey Augustine. As always, we'll be in very good touch. Thank you for listening.